to actions of people doing interesting stuff in in kitchens and it has actually ballooned and sort of snowballed into many interesting topics since one of those has been uh, what hazel has looked at is sort of what she what that slide is titled what are you doing and how you're doing it and i think this is this is a very interesting topic for manipulation cognitive science and vision researchers all together coming uh, where understanding of activities is a necessity or a prerequisite to build uh, systems for both visual understanding, but also for people who are working on reward design or manipulation or pure just RL. Uh, so with that, I would like to have Hazel uh, take it over, take it away. Right. Thank you very much, Anamish, for the introduction. Um, and good morning, everyone. So I've titled the talk, What Are You Doing and How Are You Doing It? And basically what I'm going to talk about is Epic Kitchens under the what are you doing and then move on to some work in skill determination and adverbs to look more at how you're doing it. So first I'm going to start by explaining what I mean by fine grained action understanding so you'll understand what I talk about later. So in this video there's lots of different ways to describe what's happening. At a coarse grained level you could say that the person's cooking or you might say what particular dish they're cooking. Um, for fine-grained under action understanding, we're really trying to look at the individual object interactions in the video. So this we'd label cutting bell pepper. And we want to distinguish that from the same action with a different object, so cutting onion, and the same um, object with a different verb, such as washing bell pepper. Um, and so a lot of the humorous group of Bristol is particularly interested in egocentric video, so first-person video. Um, because it gives you this really nice, clear view of these fine grade actions, which you might not see as well from third person video. Um, but back in 2018, when we first collected Epic Kitchens, there weren't many large scale egocentric data sets. And many of the third person data sets tend to focus on coarser grained actions. Uh, so we created the Epic Kitchens data set to try and solve that. And then last year, we've just extended that to 100 hours of unscripted kitchen based object interactions. Um, and so how did we go about doing that? Well, we started with the data collection. Um, and the idea of this is we really wanted to uh, collect natural interactions. So we just sent people home with a GoPro um, and we asked that every time they entered their kitchen, they put on the camera and start recording. And that way we get very natural interaction. So it includes all the different activities people might do in their home kitchen and even the times that they do them at. Um, yeah. Um, and the other benefit of that is because we're just getting people to record these untrimmed videos and pick the actions out of them, that you can maybe extend this to like longer term temporal understanding stuff in the future. So we're trying not to limit it to just these individual actions because while that's what we work on in video understanding quite a bit at the moment, it's not necessarily what we want to be working on in video understanding forever because it's a very short section of video. Um, because they're untrimmed videos, we found it quite hard well, we needed to make the narration scalable um, because there's lots of actions happening very quickly because people are in their home kitchens, they're in a familiar environment and they just naturally do what they're doing and they probably don't want to spend all day cooking dinner so they're doing one action after another after another. So to do that we got people to do live narrations after they'd recorded, so not during because that would distract them, but we got them to watch their videos back and then they'd say the actions they were doing over the top of the video. Um, and using the person that had recorded the video really helped because they know what the objects were in their kitchen and they don't have to like work out what that particular bottle of sauce is or something like that. And we also got people to do it in their native language so they wouldn't have to translate in their head what these weird kitchen objects were that they were using. Um, and so from these live narrations we annotate the start and end time of the actions which gives us the original Epic Kitchen state set. And then last year we extended it because we wanted even more footage. Um, so we collected more data with more natural interactions. Um, we changed the pipeline a little. So one of the problems with the original data set, well, wasn't such a problem, it was more uh, a stressful aspect of recording for the participants was that they had to, because they had to do this live narration, they're kind of just like yelling all the actions they see, like pick up bottle, put down bottle, pour on this after another. And sometimes you can miss stuff out. Um, so we introduced this pause and talk narrator. So people would just press pause when they saw an action, 
and they could describe it as long as they wanted. Um, so that it allowed them to give a bit more detail in the in the actions and also made the weak annotations of these like points where they pause a bit more accurate. Um, and it resulted in much richer uh, action segments. That gave us a new version of Epic Kitchens, which we call Epic Kitchens 100 because it has 100 hours of footage. Um, this is just like a sort of example of the 37 different participants. So you can see um, there's lots of different environments for these interactions to be in, which is quite nice because we can sort of disentangle it from the same environment. Um, and one of the interesting things we have about this new version of the data set is we got people that had already recorded for us to come back. So we have 16 people that returned. Um, and that was really good because one of the things we're interested in with this new data set is the domain gap between the footage we recorded originally in 2018 and the new footage we recorded last year. So you might think there's probably not much of a gap because people are still doing cooking in their kitchens. Um, but actually some, some small details like the fact that we upgraded the camera, the fact that we've got slight different sets of participants, and the fact that the action annotations are slightly denser means there is actually quite a big domain gap between these two bits of footage. Um, and the returning participants kind of give us a nice way to study that. So sometimes you have the same people doing a similar thing in their kitchen. So this is one participant doing the washing up in 2018 and 2020, and you can see the footage does look a bit different and that kind of is a challenge for current video recognition models. Again, yes, something similar. It was interesting actually, uh, which participants would do the same thing two years later and which had moved on. Um, it was funny. Um, and so eight people moved heads as well. So we have the same person potentially doing a similar thing, uh, but in a different environment. In both cases here, this person's making pizza. Um, and Sorry, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, um, the is there any consistency in the in the set of narrations and descriptions of uh, the actions? So, uh, if someone describes making an omelette or cutting onion in one video, is that consistent with other videos? No. So, so people describe it how they choose. So they'll say. So in the example making omelette, right, there's certain steps you need to do. So like pick up eggs and stuff is going to be in both. But mm -hmm. like the, because we're using open vocabulary, they might use like synonyms of different verbs, Got it. Uh, which is quite a challenge um, in the action retrieval part of the data set, because these, th these data sets that exist already tend to assume that the, um, you know, one, one thing that describes one video is completely different to one thing that describes another video, but actually this mm -hmm. is a bit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that is quite an, quite an issue, but hopefully Epic Kitchens goes part way to solving it. Because um, of the evaluation we've got allows for these synonyms in that challenge. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, so to, to give a sort of sense of scale, we've got 90,000 action segments, and they're over the combination of verbs and nouns in 97 different verb classes and 300 different noun classes. And there's quite a clear long tail distribution. So uh, in one case we've got like here, we've got over 10,000 instances of take or pick up, but we've got less than 10 of like something like mark or bend. Um, so that's another big open challenge is this long tailed distribution. In Epic Kitchens, we've got five different challenges. So the first is obviously this action recognition. And for that, you have like this trimmed clip uh, of the start and end time, and you look at just the, that action, and you've got to say the verb or noun that's associated with that action. Um, also, action anticipation. And the idea of that is basically you observe part of the video, but you're not saying what's happening in that part of the video. You're saying what happens in the next part of the video, um, which is quite quite challenging for humans as well in some cases. Um, one of the things that the new version that we collected last year really allowed us to do was action detection, just because we have these denser uh, annotations of videos. Um, so you're missing a lot less actions out when we annotate this time. So you can really segment all the different actions out. Um, 
this is quite challenging just because there's so many different actions happening at once. So quite a lot of action uh, localization stuff tends to be like one or two actions happening in a video. So the fact that these are potentially co-occurring and happening so quickly one after another. And if you look at the RGB frames, you'd probably just describe this as washing up normally rather than each individual action. Um, then another thing yeah, I'd mentioned earlier was action retrieval. So instead of doing this in the action uh, recognition, where we segment it into different classes so you don't have this problem of overlap with the synonym, synonyms. So you've got like a particular action that is different from each other action, hopefully. But in action retrieval, there's all this overlap of this natural language, um, which is challenging. Uh, and it might be a bit more specific. And then finally, there's also the main adaptation challenge, which is this idea of training on the data we originally collected and testing on the newly collected data. So as you can see from the source only, there is quite, a, even with the this uh, action recognition domain adaptation method, there's still quite a big gap uh, in between these two, where there's a lot more blue things in one area and a lot more red in the other and less overlap, even though quite a lot of the actions are appearing in both data sets. Um, and the reason we have so many challenges in this data set is kind of because in action, in actions, you tend to have like one model that's doing your action retrieval, and then you're going to test this on your specific action retrieval data set, and this might be completely different to your action anticipation model. Um, so actually by having all these challenges on one data set, the hope is that there can be some sort of like action pre-training stuff that then you could apply to all these different target tasks on Epic Kitchens. So we haven't looked at that yet, but that's that's the hope that someone will, will have a look at that at some point. Um, there's more information about Epic Kitchens on the website uh, and in the papers. So I'm going to go beyond what is happening now. Um, so the stuff in Epic Kitchens, these are two videos from Epic Kitchens, and the, the labels all mean that you could probably recognize that these two people are peeling onions. Um, and also in this video, they'll go on to put the onion peel in the bin, and they'll also um, slice the onion. There's still like differences between these videos that we can probably see as humans that these even fine-grained action annotations aren't going to recognize or describe. So this person on the right might be doing the uh, peeling and chopping slightly better. Um, they're doing the chopping a bit quicker, and they probably did the peeling a bit more neatly. Um, it's these sort of how people are doing the actions and how well they're doing them that I'm going to move on to focus on now. So first, how well? Um, so we're going to look at the problem of skill determination. And the goal in skill determination is to learn to rank a set of videos of a particular task, um, where the task is often minutes in length. So this example is braiding hair. Um, and we're training each model for each task separately. We're not trying to learn similarities between uh, something like braiding hair and applying eyeliner, but we want the same model to be applicable to lots of different tasks. So you train it on that task, test it on that task, train it on another task, test it on that other task, um, rather than like some handcrafted features for a particular skill in a particular task. And why would we want to do that? So maybe for automated assessment and feedback, or maybe in like an uncurated collection of videos, you want to know who to learn from, either from a human or a robot. Um, and it's worth noting that there's some related work in action quality assessment, and that tends to focus on shorter actions, such as diving or gymnastic vaults. Um, and there you're trying to regress to a ground truth Olympic score of the task. Um, Sadly, we don't have Olympic scores for the daily living class we're looking at in this data set, like pizza rolling. Um, so instead, what we do to collect the data is we get people to rank pairs of videos. So saying which video is better in these two drawing tasks is maybe a bit more easier than like trying to assign an Olympic score for drawing. Um, so from these pairs of videos, you just pick which one's better. And that's going to be our input to our model, not also our annotations. We want the overall model to be able to rank like a full set of videos. So in this case, the drawing, we maybe recognize that this person's doing it a bit worse because they've messed up the proportions of the sonic they're trying to draw. Um, and this person does it a bit better. This one's quite good and these are somewhere in the middle. So we want the model to do this overall ranking. 
And one of the challenges in skill determination is that the videos can be quite long. So here, this is someone scrambling eggs, and this is going to take minutes. Um, and that's not typically a time period most uh, video understanding networks operate on. And within that, you're going to have points where there's things completely irrelevant to the skill, like this person pouring milk in the pan. Um, and you're also going to have sort of variability in the skills. So this person on the right actually ends up producing better scrambled eggs, but at the start, they kind of cracked the eggs by just mashing them into the pan, which is probably less good, but you want to be able to take all that into account and have like an overall skill ranking. Um, so for that, we want to find what we're calling the skill relevant parts of a video and ignore these other irrelevant segments. So how do we actually do that? The starting point is this pair of videos um, with one ranked higher than the other in terms of skill. And we're taking lots of temporal segments from extracted I3D features. So we've got 400 across the video. Um, and just as a naive way, we're going to try and uniformly average these to get a video level uh, feature. And then from this video level feature, we're going to assign a rank or like a pseudo score. And this loss is basically saying that this higher ranked video should have a higher score than this lower ranked video by a particular margin M. Um, so it doesn't really matter what the score is. It's just that this one should be higher than this one by a particular margin. That's like kind of the basic way of doing this pairwise ranking. Um, and like I said, we want some sort of skill relevant segment um, or paying attention to the skill relevant parts. So one way to do that might be to introduce some temporal attention. And this attention module is just two fully connected layers that predicts a weighting for each of these I3D features and then can um, and, um, weight these by the, the weights it's predicted in the averaging. Hazel, maybe ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Or would you, would you prefer we wait until the end? Now it's fine. Okay, uh, Raid uh, has a question. Um, who is doing the ranking here? As in, where are you getting the labels? Uh, is it so Empirikers or some? Yeah, there? we get them from Mechanical Turk. So they just see these pair of videos like I showed you. Um, we get multiple people to do it just to avoid the noise in Mechanical Turk and only take the pair when all, I think it was four people agree that one pair is ranked higher than the other, just to avoid anywhere they're like the same rank or some noise in the ranking. But yeah, we're just okay. doing the same task I showed you where you see two videos, people pick the better one and we just take the consensus. Uh, the and then the, because this is a very tricky problem because uh, the data is sort of, um, as you said, minutes long sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you the only just to confirm this the only uh, label that you get for any pair of videos is their relative ranking. That's all. Yeah. You do not get any ranking. sort of any sort of frame wise label or nothing. No. It's just yeah. So two, of, people have watched yeah. both videos and they've gone, okay, this one is better, but we don't know yeah. why they've said it's better or anything like that. We just know people agree that one's better than the other. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's kind of weekly supervised in that you're looking at the parts in the video, but. Yeah, the task itself is supervised, but you'll, you don't have many labels. Uh, as a follow-up question, mm -hmm. I believe uh, the answer to this I might know, but uh, in skill determination, do you also consider finer grained features such as hand gestures or hand dexterity, or this is something that is not explicitly labeled? I haven't done it, and I haven't seen anyone else do it. Some people do skeletons when they're looking at Olympic sports. Um, because it's like quite a complex action in like a couple of seconds. So you really need the skeletons. I think hands might be helpful, but you'd probably want before that, you'd probably want some sort of long, better temporal modeling between what's happening, like a better understanding as well as these hands, because putting in all these hand motions is probably going to confuse it when it's looking at slightly higher level features. Than that. Wonderful. Carry on. Thanks. OK. Um, Right, so when we tried just introducing this uh, basic attention way of doing this, we found it didn't work very well at all. So um, I was, I had one example where I was trying to train it for scrambling eggs and it was originally, it started coming out at like 80%. I was like, oh, great, problem solved. And then the next run, it came out at 60%. And that kind of variability isn't really what you're after um, in any sort of computer vision model. Um, so to fix that, we introduced this disparity loss. 
And it's the same format as these other losses. So you're still saying this number here in this bracket should be higher than this number here. And what this loss in particular is saying is that the difference between the two videos when they're ranked with the attention modules should be larger than the difference than when they're ranked by the uniform modules. So in effect, you're saying that the attention module should be better at separating these two videos in the ranking than the uniform weighting because it's being allowed to choose what it looks at. And actually stabilized the training quite a bit. So it was less variable and improve the results a bit. The other thing we wanted was, we noticed that um, what the features that it might want to look at in a low skill video are probably gonna be different to the features in a high skill video. So people might do mistakes in a low, in, when they're low skill and these aren't gonna be present in a high school video. So you kind of really wanna look at different things between maybe where, where the video is in the ranking. So, Again, we just tried a naive way of doing that. So we stuck in another attention module, another ranking loss, another disparity loss. And of course, it just does exactly the same thing as the other branch because there's no reason it wouldn't really. Um, they both just look at the same parts of the video and nothing changes. So to fix that, we have this rank aware loss. And again, it's the same format of loss. We're saying um, when you're ranking the videos with the attention modules, that that should be better at separating the videos than with the uniform modules. But what we're particularly saying here is that when you're looking at the high skill parts of the higher ranked video compared to the high skill, uh, the low skill parts of the lower ranked video, this should give you really the best separation in your ranking. So look at the good parts, of the good video, bad parts, of the bad video, and this should be further apart. And it says that it should be further apart because this margin M3 is larger than the margin in the other two losses, basically it pushes them apart a bit more and that actually did make the attention modules diverge to look at slightly different things so to show you some results um we've got nine different tasks we're trying to test on and one of the challenges with skill determination is that no model is going to work very well for all of your different tasks so in general we find it works quite well the margin ranking loss is like just the naive normal loss we had at the start um, the diversity is just a different way to encourage them to look at different things without this idea of high skill and low skill. And then the disparity in the rank aware losses were the ones I just went through in the previous slide. Um, so generally they'll help, but for tasks like origami or surgery, they don't really capture all the nuance of those tasks still. Um, so it's quite a challenge to be able to do it for all these different tasks. Um, to show you what the attention modules actually look at. So here, this is the responses from the low skill attention module. So the bits it typically pits out as low skill. So in surgery, you'll see that this middle stick bends or vibrates quite often as, as a sign of low skill, because obviously you don't want people pulling at your insides when they're doing surgery. And in an origami, you'll see people undoing the, a previous fold as like a sign of low skill potentially. Um, and then some high skill responses. So this kind of hints at um, another open challenge in skill determination, which is sharing features between tasks. So for both dough rolling and origami, you've got people neatening the edges. Like they, they neaten the edges in a completely different way between tasks, but there's still some level of shared semantic um, features between what makes people skilled in this task. Um, so currently all the models are trained on dough rolling tested on dough rolling then trained separately for origami and tested on that. Um, but that kind of prevents it from being scalable. So hopefully at some point someone will find a way to share these features between these different tasks. Um, but the features for drawing kind of indicate why this might be a bit tricky because here it's picking up people hesitating. So in the drawing they're pausing to think and consider what they're going to do next, which is great for drawing because you need to kind of plan it out but this hesitation is going to be a sign of low skill in other tasks. So that kind of makes it quite hard to share features because you don't know what's going to be good in one task and good in another. Um, yeah, so that's my work on skill determination, um, which focuses on how well something's done. I have a few questions about yeah. the skill determination part, particularly, uh, particularly if you can go back to the model um, I was really curious about 
uh, yes, here. What sort of, uh, do you, first of all, because you had these separate data sets, the surgery data set uh, and the Epic Kitchens version, uh, do you train them separately? Uh, do you put yeah. all of this together and then train it together? So every task is trained separately. Um, if your model capacity is large enough, you can train them together and that doesn't really affect their results. But if you try, if you reduce the capacity, it doesn't really share features between the tasks. It generally just makes it worse. Um, the other question is, is I3D the right pre-featurization? Because I3D is a very strong sort of, um, let's say, um, model, which comes with a particular kind of bias that featurizes these things, right? Uh, and I've looked at I3D and it's good for, um, what I would call um, action classification. Mm. Uh, if you are given clips, uh, I3D, but people have worked on this and multiple others have shown that it may not be able to, yeah, it may I, not I be think... the best model to capture motion. It is good model to capture, uh, let's say frame-wise images. Yeah. Of, yeah. yeah, I think if I was doing it again, I'd look in the features a lot more because I think the features are part of the reason why it really doesn't work or improve results for surgery in origami because, so the daily living tasks, it works quite well on, but surgery is so different a domain to kinetics, which I3D is pre-trained on. It just doesn't have a hope. And origami yeah. is basically, you're seeing hands and paper over and over again, and it can't really tell the difference between one set of hands and paper and another set of hands and paper. So yeah, that I can might imagine. be where the, so the that's hands like come a, into it. Too fine grade, yes. The other yeah. thing is, did you do any sort of um, choice of like, what is the frequency of frames that is going in? So these videos are usually captured at something like 20, 30 FPS or sometimes even more, uh, but you usually for, for the sake of like model size, you don't push through 30 frames for a single video per second. So do you subsample? Yeah, so all the videos are resampled to 25 FPS and then the feature covers, I think 32 frames. Uh, each feature covers 32 frames in the video, so assemble at two FPS. Well, yeah. Um, and then we're just taking 400 uniformly from the video. So in quite a lot of tasks, these features have quite a lot of overlap um, because we're just uniformly sampling. So each feature is like the same fixed window, but where it comes from is different. Okay. But origami again is, is a problem here because that, that can be 10 minutes long. So actually you end up missing out some of these bits. So again, yeah, for that task, you probably need denser sampling, but we didn't try it. That's completely fine. Uh, yes, I think this is, this is a wonderful problem. Uh, wait, do we have another question? No. Yeah, go for it. Oh, go ahead, Florian. So um, I understand the, um, the need for weak supervision uh, at the very end, um, but since it makes the credit assignment problem a bit or, or much harder, uh, have you considered essentially doing some sort of a rough uh, reward uh, sketching uh, so that you can say you can give zero reward for parts of the video that are irre irrelevant to the task? Uh, you know, high reward for parts of the video where that show high skill and negative reward for parts of the video that show repetition or something going wrong. Yeah, I mean, at, at one point we considered annotating like which bits are maybe irrelevant, but the the issue is, we, well, in the end we were really trying to want, we wanted to try and share features between different tasks. So it was a kind of a problem that all these tasks were trained independently and then collect needing to collect annotations for every single task is already kind of a burden. So increasing that annotation load was kind of not the direction we wanted to go in, in the end. Mm -hmm. um, it would definitely be useful and would probably be useful to like see what your model's doing and just evaluate that. But yeah, we, yeah. we wanted to more scale the annotations to different tasks rather than look at a particular task in, in detail. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. I think is that it for questions at the moment. Cool, right, go on to adverbs then. So, Skill determination was looking at how well people were doing, um, but it's not really how people are doing it. So to look at how in more detail, we'd maybe want to know whether someone was doing an action quickly or slowly, or whether they're chopping the spring onion finely or coarsely, or filling up this jug partially or completely. Um, and to look at the how, we're looking at these adverbs, like quickly and slowly. Um, 
And we found that instructional videos were quite a good source of adverts because not only are people in the instructional videos telling you the steps you need to do to do a task and what order you need to do them in, they're also telling you how to do those individual steps when it's important to do them a particular way. Um, and they quite often use adverbs in these instructional video narrations to indicate the how you should be doing that task. So what we're wanting to do is we have these uh, instructional videos and we have a narration um, that contains an action and an adverb that applies to this, um, an adverb that applies to this action. We're wanting to learn kind of a representation for this adverb, finally. Um, and this might apply to lots of different actions. So here we've got it applying to both slice and spread. Um, and the idea is it'll modify these different actions, maybe in a similar way. So, um, but it'll look quite different between these two actions. So spread finally is gonna look very different to slice finally. Um, and again, we have this problem of the, what we're looking at temporally because these are untrimmed instructional videos. There's lots of noise in them. There's lots of people doing different things. So while this person is saying that they're finally slicing an inch of ginger, you're also seeing that they're, them doing something else. You're seeing their face. You want to ignore all of these and just focus on this action because you can't really learn finally slice until you've found slice. Like it doesn't make it makes sense to learn finally slice from this segment at the end here. Um, yeah, so we're trying to learn this video text embedding where we have the video and we also have actions and we also have adverbs. And we're going to represent an adverb as like a modification on top of this action. So you have a function that just changes a slice to a slice finally and will change a spread to a spread finally. And we want to do this for lots of different adverbs on these different actions. So how do we actually do that? We have this 20 second clip around where the person's mentioning that they're rolling quickly um, or whatever other action they're doing. And we're trying to learn the quickly and also partially the rolling from this clip. So like I said, we have this joint video text embedding. So we're trying to embed the video that contains both the action and the adverb close to the portion of, uh, to the text representation of both this action and adverb. Um, how do we embed the text? We start with a pre-trained of embedding of the action. Um, and then we learn an action modifier, which is represents our adverb on top of this. This is just a linear operator in the space that takes an action as input, or yeah, to, modifies the action and outputs a text representation of the action composed with the adverb. That's the idea. And this modifier is it's unique to quickly, but it's not unique to rolling quickly. So we share this quickly one over different actions. So from this modifier, it could also take in cutting and then it would output cutting quickly. And then how do we do the video um, um, embedding? So again, I3D features, here we're taking one per second. Um, and like I said, we want this idea of some sort of temporal attention. So we really look at the segments that are relevant to the action. And here we're using scale dot product attention like you'll find in the transformer. Um, and our keys and values are the video segments, but we're not trying to do self attention. Um, so our query is not the video segments. Instead, we want our query because we want to pay attention to the segments that contain the action of interest. So we can learn the adverb that applies to that action. We use the um, embedding of the action as a query to find the segment of relevance. And that's how we embed the video. And then there's just two losses on top of this. One of them that says this should be close to the action. So this video embedding should be closer to rolling than it should be cutting. And the other one that says it should be closer to rolling quickly than the opposite adverb. So closer to rolling quickly than rolling slowly. Um, for training and testing, we're using a subset of how to million, which is cross tasks, the 83 tasks in cross task. Um, and we're limiting it to just these tasks because we had quite a big problem with noise. So obviously these videos are very noisy, but particularly with adverbs, you'd get things like there'd be a video of someone reading a book 
And then all your adverbs would come from this one instance of someone reading a book because it's using quite descriptive language. Um, so we kind of had to ignore those videos. So even in this subset, we've still got 50% of cases where neither the action or the adverb is present around this 20 seconds where the thing's mentioned. Um, and we've got quite a limited subset of adverbs because, I mean, this is the first work to look at weekly supervised learning of adverbs. So we're only looking at six. We're looking at partially, completely, quickly, slowly, and finally, coarsely. But the challenge is to be able to recognize these across the 72 different actions. Um, and then here's just an example of what the method comes out with. So this is an iteration, and we're looking for mix, and we're trying to determine how that mix was done. And you're going to see that the border gets thicker um, when the attention for mix is, is higher. So here it's now recognizing that mix is happening and this border is increasing. Um, and now it predicts quickly. Uh, and we do the same thing for different actions. So here you've got turning, and they're turning it quickly. So it will get thicker when you see the turn. There we go. Um, and then we do this for different adverbs as well. One of the issues we've got is here is there's a dip that's recognized, but then we'll also see this, it's probably more of a coat, but it's also people dipping it in the sugar here. Um, and it kind of has a tension for both of them. So it, it can't really disentangle when two similar actions happen one after another, which is a limitation. One of the interesting things we found was that um, even when you're querying with different actions in the segment, you can still find them. So. Although this video here is narrated for mix, we can find the mix where the person's using the blender, but we can also query it for pour and find this pour later on where someone's pouring um, the mixture, and also this adjust where someone moves the sieve handle. Um, and then just to show the embedding space. So before training, obviously these adverbs are completely disentangled, the I3D features. Um, Oh, completely tangled up with the I3D features. Um, when we're training, we are able to separate out the pairs of uh, antonyms, so the opposites. So you'll see completely or partially are completely separate, and quickly and slowly are mostly separate. But the interesting thing is that, so this is the same space I've just separated out into two bits so you can see the pairs. But actually, it means that this quadrant in the bottom is both partially and slowly, whereas this quadrant over here ends up being partially and quickly. So it kind of ends up predicting like a multiple adverbs, even though it's only labeled with one. Um, and some actual numbers. Um, the task, there, there isn't any other adverb works weekly supervised. So we're comparing to ob object and adjectives because it's kind of similar in that an adjective will modify an object similar to how an adverb modifies a, an action. Um, and generally, because these methods don't have to consider where something's happening, either in an image or a video, they're not going to do very well. Um, and we're retrieving, we're both trying to do, um, we're trying to retrieve the right adverb from watching the video and compared to its antonym or compared to all other adverbs. And we're also trying to rank videos by how much they display this adverb. Um, also looking at temporal attention stuff. So, I've been taking this 20 second clip and just assuming that this is what we need to find the action. So just comparing this to like the single second around when it's mentioned actually doesn't do very well. You really do need this wide clip to try and find the action. So either just taking this single second isn't very good, nor is averaging this entire clip just because so many actions happen one after another. Um, and the interesting thing we found is our method was quite a bit better than just learning attention for each individual action class because we've got quite a few actions where there's not many occurrences. So because it, we're using the embedding to, to query the attention, it can share some similarities between the attention for different similar classes. Um, and again, this is the temporal uh, window increasing or decreasing. So this 20 seconds is it's quite robust to like all the different actions that happen around it. So even up to 30 seconds, it's able to find the right action. Although after that, there's sort of just too many things happening, maybe too many similar actions for it to, to find what's going on. Um, and another experiment we did is kind of did this and then we're like, wait a second, isn't what we're doing just action localization? Because uh, we're trying to find the, the action of interest to be able to learn this adverb. 
So we were like, okay, we, we better compare to these action localization methods. And so we take the segments that these action localization methods recognize as doing the action of interest and try and learn these action modifiers on top of them. So that's just this middle row here. Um, and even when we add in our attention as well, this generally performs quite a bit worse. So it's better to do it all in one, just because these methods are the stuff they usually use, they're designed for is like um, a big long video with maybe one or two actions happening. And they, there's a lot of background frames and occasionally something will happen. But in these instructional videos, you've got like quite dense actions happening one after another. Oh yeah, that's, that's adverbs. Uh, any questions? Yes, I think uh, I have so many. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so for the adverbs part, I think first question that I have is, you mentioned that you did it weekly supervised and uh, the results uh, or this problem is clearly very hard. Has there been an effort that is not weekly supervised, but maybe like has more supervision just to understand, is this problem even solvable? So there's one, there's one work that did, um that did adverbs in a simplified way, they had they were more focused on facial expression, so like doing an action happily or enthusiastically. Um, so they use like face bounding boxes to do it, which is why I say it's the only weekly supervised, uh, yeah, we're the only weekly supervised one. But it's kind of a different problem because we're more looking at the like object interactions rather than necessarily sort of how someone's uh, emotions are when they're doing an action. The other question I wanted to ask is, is it even fair to do this? Because this is something that um, I have uh, struggled with because you are asking too much of a model. You are providing it with small data set or reasonably small data set uh, where the labels are highly um, ambiguous, if you will, right? Uh, and you're not providing even frame-wise labels. You're providing uh, a label for video, lib video or segment rather than, um, rather than frames. Uh, is it a data problem for, for it to go beyond that? Is it something that, so for example, let's take uh, one of your own examples, right? So cutting fast or slow kind of argument, right? This is what you were showing, right? Uh, how, uh, how can we do something where, uh, where you can actually learn features. So in the same way you can learn features for action determination, is this cutting versus, versus action? Can you, is it a better idea to create adverb categories and then identify is this fast or slow? Or how do you even identify these things? Because uh, right now it feels to me that it's either we are limited by data, we just need orders of magnitude more data to even bu build such dis discriminative models. Uh, or grounding of such adverbs is very tricky, especially in motion. Yeah, I think so. So trying to learn like features for quickly, I think is maybe not such a good idea. So we kind of borrowed ideas from the uh, adjectives on objects for this, where they're saying kind of, there isn't like a prototypical instance of like um, someone doing something, like something being sliced finely or something, right? There's, um, it's a modification on what is being sliced or how this action is being done, which is why we don't learn features. I think there's definitely some subjectivity to it, but the fact that people use adverbs to describe things in language as being a particular way means people can recognize it, the model should be able to recognize it. I think you could definitely solve it with more data. It might be less interesting to do so. so I think one of the big things coming out, at least in actions as well, is like this idea of compositionality. So you're trying to learn how this action applies to this particular object and how these two things work together. You've got a similar problem with adverbs in that you can't really learn just quickly on its own. You've got to learn how quickly applies to this particular thing. But it's maybe not interesting to learn that this is cutting quickly, this is slicing quickly, and not be able to extend that to more actions because you're just never going to be able to, to do that. You, you could probably do lots with the data, but it's probably more interesting to try and um, to try and extend it to different actions. Are there any works which use some sort of self-supervision in this case? I haven't, so, so there's, there's, there is some works that like focus on what I'd say is a particular set of adverbs, right? So there's, there's works which focus, there's like the speediness net, um, 
that I think from Bill Freeman and Tally Dekal. So they're trying to trying to just look at this quickly stuff. So you can certainly do particular self supervisions for particular sets of adverbs, like the speed or something. Um, it's quite a challenge to try to unify it across different adverbs because because the speed you can easily do by changing the the frames of a video and that speeds up the action, but to make something more complete is not really a, a self-supervised thing you can add into the video as, as well. Fair enough. I think others, I, I see Raid uh, has questions, <laughs> uh, but others who have questions, I can help moderate. So put your hand up uh, in the participant screen and I can sort of do this. So go ahead, Raid, and then uh, others can put their hand up in the in the reactions. Your, your mic doesn't seem to be working so great. Do you want to type in your question? While, while Ray types in, Florin, go ahead. Yeah, so just to, uh, to ask a, bit, a few more questions about the self-supervision side or even the weak supervision side. So um, if you were to, so a lot of these adverbs uh, would basically describe uh, a discrete range of, uh, of modifiers, right? You do not want to have a continuous level of uh, modulation to these actions. You want, you know, slow, fast, somewhere in between, yeah. something like that. So, so it's, it's a low level classification. It's a small class classification problem. So why not try to show the model different types of variations for the same small clip uh, and say, you know, fine, uh, very fine uh, or rough, uh, pieces of uh, chopping, just to show examples like that. So we have a baseline where we, so this classifier MLP is like this, this baseline where we're just trying to classify the adverb without any knowledge of this action and just say, mm -hmm. okay, this is fine, this is coarse, this is partially, this is completely, and there's lots of different action variations. <laughs> and we've kind of find it really does need the context um, around, of what the action is happening to know how it's changing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's definitely a good a good naive way to do it. Um, but yeah, we, we found after doing the experiment that you really need this context. Um, the other thing is eventually you probably do want this scale of this is more quickly than this one, this is more finely than this one, but guessing those annotations is a challenging thing in itself. So we kind of went for the we went for the classification aspect, but it's probably not the best way to look at adverbs. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll follow up with more questions after Rave. Hi, uh, thanks. Can you hear me now? Oh, awesome. Okay, thanks. Uh, I uh, Thanks, Hazel. That was a great presentation. Uh, I, I had a few questions, but I guess, uh, can you go back to that slide where you're doing that uh, uh, action modifier, like uh, the, the high-level architecture? diagram you had? Yeah, before that. Yeah, this one, this one. Yeah, thanks. Um, so here, um, this uh, GA, like, sorry, this is a low level question. I'm just yeah, curious. Perfect. The, the word embedding, like, uh, it, it, what's the, like, are you embedding each word separately or is it like a context? So it, it's like one context or embedding, just what, what is the, uh, and, and when you're doing that, so basically, I guess, let's say, you have something like cut thinly, then dip completely. Okay, in this case, you have that in that temporal window. And how would uh, the action modifier work and the word embedding flow go? Can you talk a little bit about it? So the word embedding is just a particular word embedding for each action we've got. So it's okay. just the glove embedding. So there's okay. a, a particular embedding for rolling, a particular embedding for whatever, and that just comes straight from the glove embedding of it. Okay. Um, so each action is different, and then each adverb has its own action modifier. So the modifier for cutting slowly and whisking slowly is going to be the same slowly modifier, but it just applies to a different action. So it just takes that glove one and transforms that in the space, and we just have a different modifier for each different adverb. I see. I see. Um, we also tried comparing this to like the glove embedding of the adverb, it doesn't work very well having just a, a spatial embedding of an adverb as opposed to the transformation of the adverb, right. we found. And the other problem is 
because all these word embeddings tend to be like co-occurrence things of like when words co-occur. Um, adverbs all co-occur at similar points to when their antonym co-occurs, which means your embedding of your adverb in its antonym is very similar, which is obviously not what you want when you're trying to like determine quickly from slowly. So I see. we didn't use um, pre-trained embeddings at all for the adverbs. I see. And then you use the so, sort of attention as like, uh, is there, uh, do you do you, like in the video frames, do you do any uh, fine grain grounding within the video frames or is it just like the features and then you have those attention modules? Yeah. It, okay. It's just like a frame level feature and then we do that. It definitely could, it definitely benefits from spatial attention. I've done the experiment. It, it does do better. Um, one of the problems is we have so when you've like localized it temporally, when the action's happening, it's quite often two actions are happening at the same time. One yeah. of them might be happening quickly, the other might be happening slowly. So you've kind of got no hope. So yeah, spatial attention definitely helps, but. I see. Yeah. Um, and I guess one observation, I mean, have you like, uh, you know, you had, you talked a lot, a lot about like, you know, I guess, adverb like grouping or classification or clustering of different adverb classes. So have you tried using, I mean, there's a lot of rich literature on actually like VARF class classifications and there's a lot of like linguistic sort of, I guess those would be more like concrete, like linguistic theories about how those VARF classes can be grouped into uh, different classes and what can they take as arguments? Like how can they modify their de definite classes that these classes will be, can be modified in certain, there's constraints and stuff. So I'm just wondering if, if uh, like integrating that knowledge into your model, would that help uh, here? Um, I, I think it would, but I, I'm just, have you looked into any of those or? Yeah, I think it would definitely help. So we didn't really look into it. So the, the idea of this action modifier comes from this paper on object stuff, which in turn comes from this paper on the, um, how adjectives work on objects. Um, so, Partially it's linguistically inspired after like a few goes. I haven't really looked into linguistic stuff okay. because we kind of wanted a simpler approach as like the first sort of thing in the task. It's definitely something that would probably help, um, but it might also overcomplicate the task a bit when you've got these different contexts and different things happening. Okay. And uh, I guess uh, just last follow up is that in your uh, 3D, like the features you use i3D, I think Animish touched on it as well. Um, so uh, did, did you do any like ablation studies on how doing different, like the features extraction, like as opposed to doing i3D, like let's say more, um, I don't know, just doing, let's say another object detector layer to it, does that change? Like, did you look into, was there any ablation studies? Done. Yeah, we didn't we didn't try doing anything with the features. We kind of took it as a yeah, there's this there's kind of there's many interesting things to look at in the model and there's only limited time. So we yeah, just yeah. did the uh, everyone else takes i 3 d features, let's take some more i3D features. But yeah, they definitely different features would definitely help, probably. Because um for some adverbs you're really looking at really coarse grained things that i 3 is just not gonna have the potential to yeah. to model. Yeah. But then the question is which features do because you need a large scale data set for features, which is then trained on some sort of action recognition as like the closest task. So yeah, it's tricky. So okay. we are nearing the end of uh, the one hour slot. Uh, do we have any more burning questions? We may be able to take one last question. Uh, I think I do, there's no one else. Uh, no, go ahead, Florian. I don't think there's any. Yeah. Cool, uh, so a lot of this, um, type of scenarios would probably benefit from some inference of 3D or shapes or uh, sizes of objects. Um, have you thought about why or why not we should add um, this type of structure and bias into the networks or have some module that specifically predicts uh, yeah. that thing? So even before like taking into account the 3D stuff, that this doesn't really take into account the objects like at all, like it takes into account a frame level feature, right? So so the kind of first step is like spatial attention and maybe taking the objects out of the narration. We kind of didn't do that just because we didn't have the annotations for it, because I think as Animesh has seen, quite often things in the structural videos are labeled as it or something else. So 
it's hard to get the object out of it, so we just didn't bother. Um, I think these things would definitely help, but it's a question of how much do you want to complicate your model with all these different components and how much do you hope the model can just manage to learn these things and which things need to be done explicitly. Um, mm -hmm. I think in general, there's a movement video understanding to like more explicit modeling of stuff like hands and objects in general. Um, which, yeah, could definitely benefit again here, but yeah, we just didn't look into it. Got it. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, with this, uh, we would like to thank Hazel uh, for the wonderful talk and thank you everyone for the privilege of your time and, and for making this interactive and asking interesting questions. Uh, part of this talk will be hosted online and uh, Hazel will be available, if I'm correct, for the next hour or so to meet. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, meet up, the link is in the channel. Uh, and I believe it's uh, differently, not this one. Am I correct, Varun? Oh, Nishkrit, sorry. Yes, yes, it is a different link. Yeah. So, yes, let's. I just posted the link in the Zoom chat. Yeah. Should be there. So. Wonderful. So, uh, people willing to meet up with Hazel, uh, feel free to show up in that link. I'm meeting. Uh, her next, and then I think there might be one more slot at uh, 11.30 EST. So in about 30 minutes or 20 minutes or so. With that, we'd like to thank Hazel again for making the time and thank you all. See you next week. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.